Hey, everybody. My name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida, and welcome to The Al Nicoletti Show, where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their community that educate, entertain, and inspire all things Florida real estate, because that's the niche we're tackling on how you can take your company to the next level. We're all diving in on the Florida niche. And for people that are just starting out in the real estate world, you want to listen to this episode because Mary Henton has taken the real estate investing st by storm because when she was starting out, she's in the Navy. She works in that area with the military. It's the Navy. I think it is, right? Right, Mary? Yeah. Okay. So she's in the military. And when she was doing all of her work and she was like, wait a second, there's a whole real estate side to all of this investing. So we're going to dive deep on where did Mary come from? Uh, what is Mary doing today? And the first time I ever met Mary was at a networking event with all of the real estate investors. And, and she heard about me doing probates and all of this stuff. And since then we connected and she is a bubbly personality. She's always eager to learn. She's really good with numbers and data. And on the show, we're going to talk about investing in a Roth IRA, something I have no idea about. I've heard about it with New View. They're always at the sponsorships and, and everywhere in Orlando, Tampa, Jacksonville. So when investing in the Roth IRA, which could be a great avenue for people just starting out. We're going to talk about what is your why and how it applies to goals, yearly, monthly, and daily routine. So everybody's got a different daily routine. And if you're an investor, you have to switch up your routine because you are not a nine to five as most people are in the workplace. And we're also going to talk about doing your first year with data. So when Mary was doing her first year, she had to break down all the numbers when it came to a flip, when it came to doing certain things in real estate investing, she had to break it down and make sure the deal made sense for her and everybody in the deal. Otherwise, it wasn't going to be something that worked. And then we're also going to talk about what books did Mary find that were super helpful and how she found a mentorship and getting to what is your why? Deep, deep conversation that we'll have. And Mary already knows that she's going to be invited back whenever I have the in-person studio. So without further ado, Mary, welcome to my show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to share everything that I've learned. And, you know, just hopefully that some people who are out there listening get some little tidbit of data that they start running with, because that's how you start. You just like start learning and picking up little things from everybody that you meet and everybody you uh, listen to and you just go with it. You just got to start doing it and start um, going towards your goals. And for those that are listening right now, what they don't know is Mary and I talked about some of these things before, about a week or two before this episode, to really dive deep on how we could explain how she did it, how she first started, what were those steps. And we took the time to say, look, we're going to figure this out. We're going to dive deep on all of this because there are topics I don't even know about. And I didn't even know when we were talking backstage, I had no idea about investing in the Roth IRA, like how you can use that money to invest. Fascinating stuff I, I don't even know about. So Mary, for those that don't know you, you are new in the business. You are, we'll talk about how you are queen of the pea pod, right? We have to talk about that for the Yellowbird group because Yellowbird is a huge uh, community and a real estate company. And we are blessed. I have to say, Mary, we are really blessed to have such a unique investing community here in Jacksonville that I think is uh, unparalleled to other communities because everybody's dropping knowledge. People are coming and sharing their ideas and sharing their expertise on how people can really level up in their business. And having someone like you that wants to break things down is, is huge. So for those that don't know you, tell everybody, like, what were you doing before real estate in the military? What piqued your interest to get into it? And now what are you doing today tackling the real estate investing world? Yeah, so my first um, experience or touch with real estate was back in college. A professor quit class one day, told us all about like how to real, uh, what real estate is, how to leverage money. And that just like really piqued my interest. But I went along and I did my nine to five job. I actually got a uh, 
I'm a marine engineer and I worked on drill rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it like it was okay, but not really what I wanted to do. And I also have a background in military as well. So I do a little bit of that. But what really like started me out on real estate and where I started getting traction was when I started reaching out uh, to people and like connecting with people, like-minded people in the community, like Pat and Yellowbird. And that's when I started like finding how to do things. And I started sending Pat like these terrible deals. And he, he was nice enough to like, be like, well, this isn't really what we were looking for. And he would tell me exactly what they're looking for. And then I would just go out and look for it. And so I got my real estate license back in uh, September of 2019. And then uh, started doing a lot more uh, lead generation, finding those deals. And I would go to uh, Pat or somebody in the Yellowbird community that I've already met because I was networking, give them the, like, say, hey, I've got this deal. Do you think it'll work out? And would go from there. And so like I, from there, I like learned um, how to invest my IRA. And that's like one of the most unique things, I think. Not very many people do it. They always have questions about how to invest your IRA. Um, and we'll, we'll dive deep into all of that, but yeah. you, you said some interesting points there about the community, like going to Pat and talking about deals and, and, and getting to that step of actually getting something right. So everybody can hypothesize about, oh, this is what I need to learn. This is the book I need to read for real estate investing. Um, but it, I was even on a call today talking about something with probate. And the only thing I thought was like, go do it. Like get, go, go start it. Right. You can read, you can be ready, you could be prepared, but nothing will prepare you more than being in the experience and learning from your mistakes, learning from others mistakes. So when you first were really getting involved with the mentorship stuff, because I feel like this goes to mentorship stuff and Pat's big on the mentorship stuff. He would say, you know, read this book and then come talk to me kind of thing. Um, what was that like really I mean, reaching out for the first time about how do I do this? Like, where do I get started? What was that? So nerve wracking. I didn't know Pat from Adam. I'm like, you don't know me at all, but I really want to get into this and I'm determined. And no matter what, if I like, even if Pat didn't reach out to me, I would still like try and find other ways. So it's, you gotta like, not get analysis paralysis is what I think. And I'm an analytical person. Being an engineer, I'm like, I need my numbers. I need to know like what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. But I've actually found that's one of my weaknesses. And I'm like, I need to just go out, start doing it, and we'll figure it out as we go. So, um, and then the mentorship really helps because I don't know everything. And I would always like lean on people in the Yellowbird community or my mentors um, and be like, hey, I got this problem. What do I do? And they would be more than happy to help. And it, it works out for everybody. Yeah. And you have to do your part by actually proactively learning. You have to take those steps yourself. They can't do everything for you. You have to be able to reach out to people, to connect with people. Um, and, and there's so many different vendors and auxiliary companies that can really help get you into that, into that world. So before we get to like the Roth IRA, um, and maybe that's how you did your first deal, right? Is that, is that how you did it? Was using the Roth? Yeah. So uh, my first deal was um, I actually found it on a tax delinquent mailer list. Uh, I sent out um, about 2,800 mailers and um, it cost about $1,800. And uh, I blast mailed everybody who was on that list. And um, we were able to get it under contract in April of 2020. And uh, I got it for $60,000. And I'm like, okay, I've got this contract. Um, I don't really have $60,000 liquid right now. What am I going to do? So I did, however, already set up my self-directed Roth IRA with Equity Trust Company. I had a bunch of um, orphaned retirement accounts from previous employers. I had like a few grand there, a few grand there. And I'm like, this is all so confusing. Let's just simplify things. So I merged them all over to Equity Trust Company. Um, and that's where I brought my Roth IRA all in there. And we partnered, I partnered with um, Bob and Melissa Sargent with their IRA. So 
I didn't have the full um, amount to do the purchase of the house and then do the rehab as well. So that helped by partnering with their IRA. We were, I was able to like buy the house, rehab the house, and then sell the house. So um, I was, it was a 60, 40 split. I was 40, they were 60. And um, we purchased the house for $60,000. And then um, we were all in at about $100,000. And then we sold it for 160. Oh, so wow. once we sold it, yeah, it was a great return. <laughs> For sure. I mean, anybody would take that. Yeah. And it's all tax-free too, because right. I did it in my Roth IRA. So it was like game changer right there. Everybody's kind of concerned about the capital gains tax. Doesn't really, they don't really want to get into flipping because they're afraid of all the taxes re- uh, associated with it, but you can invest your IRA and there you don't have to, um, deal with the taxes afterwards, which is huge. Right. So some people, I have no idea about how you do that, right? Like I have no idea about how you even get started with that. So like, is there, you could do anything with your Roth IRA at any age, as long as you're working um, up until I think it's 70, but you know, you're not investing at 70, you're investing at like 25, 30 or 35 or at some, some era, right. At some point. So how long had you been doing it to the point you said, okay, I'm, I want to start using these companies to, to do the self-directing. Like, I don't have a clue on how you even get started with that. Like, where do you go? Like, what's the paperwork and process? Like if for people that are professionals that want to start doing it, they could be doctors, they could be lawyers, they could be any um, working at corporate America. How do you get started with doing that? Because I'm clueless. I don't do it, right? I have no idea how you do it. Filling out paperwork, anything like that, how? Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned, it was orphaned retirement accounts. So I was no longer with that company. So that, um, retirement account was just with a custodian, say, uh, fidelity and you go to fidelity, you fill out their paperwork and, um, say you no longer want them to be your custodian and you direct it over to equity trust company. And, You have to um, fill out an application with equity trust and they build a portfolio for you. And then it's just a matter of transferring the money over. And then um, the custodian equity trust company. So when we actually go to purchase the house, they, um, we tell equity trust company, we are under contract and where to deliver the funds. So we use the title company that knew how to invest in um, Roth IRAs or how this process works. So they already have done it before and it really wasn't like um, a a learning experience for them. They already knew. So we just directed, we told Equity Trust Company, put $100,000 into a um, escrow account at the title company and the title company holds it. Um, They hold it, you never touch the money because Obviously, these are um, these are funds that you're not supposed to touch because <laughs> they're in your uh, retirement account. So exactly, it wasn't like a loan. I know there's ways to use uh, your retirement accounts by taking out a loan, but this wasn't the case. It's um, just a direction. It's like investing in stock. So you tell your custodian, Fidelity Trust or some or Fidelity, like, hey, I want to invest hundred dollars in Bitcoin and they'll go ahead and do that. So it's similar. It's just on another scale that people aren't really used to. I was going to ask like, how, so how much can you pull out at a time? Because with self, with Roth IRAs, you can't pull money out without getting some kind of tax penalty. So I guess this is the exception, right? When you're using, or you're doing it through these companies, how much can you pull out? So like, let's say you have, 50,000 or 70,000 saved up in your IRA Roth, right? You've been doing it since you're 30. Now you're 40 at some point, like now you start using it. How much of that money can you use from the self, from the IRA to use for the investing? Is it only like 6,000 at a time or could you use all 50? You could use all 50. I don't know if that's the smartest thing to do, but <laughs> I was going to say like, that. you want it to compound a little bit, but if you could technically, there is a way to use that money without being hit with a tax penalty 
for investing in real estate. Right. Yep. And that was just the game changer that I learned uh, by working with Bob and Melissa. They've been doing it for a while and um, some things, there are definitely rules. So, um, you have to, you can't be self-benefiting. So say you buy a house, you can't live in that house and you've bought it in your IRA. Just not, that's a no go. Oh, really? Definitely some rules and restrictions. If you buy a house in your IRA, you can't have your family members live in that house and pay rent. Um, you, buy the house in your IRA, you can't uh, do any manual labor on the house yourself. So you have to contract out everything. So that's Mary Hedden's awesome. dropping some golden nuggets right now. So these, so, so there are definitely restrictions with doing this. Yes, absolutely. There's very strict reg, uh, regulations on doing this. So you just need to know the rules and not break them. But um yeah, like, so we contracted out everything, which was really great for me because I don't really love working with my hands. I'll do it if I need to, but um, I just don't like dealing with changing out toilets or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I just never saw the money come into my bank account. It always stayed in escrow and the title company would pay out all the contractors. We would get the invoice from the contractor, tell the title company, please pay um, Bob Spalding for doing the paint and they would go ahead and pay it up right out of escrow. So it really was a very streamlined process. And then we made sure that we kept like really great detail about where the funds were going, just keep track of everything. So that way you have a paper trail and there's no question about like what you're doing in your IRA. If we're you're ready Right. Were you told when you first started that using the IRA money would probably be the smartest way to start investing? Like, how did you know that that was, that, how did you know that? Because there's investors all over that will do their mailers and do the phone calls and stuff like that. But like when you and I are talking right now, it's professional to professional, right? So it's like, wait a second, we have our careers, we have our jobs. And then what we do on this we I don't do it, but you, you could use that money to, to invest. You have that side gig. So but a lot of investors are doing it out of their own pocket because that's that's what they do for their business. You're using it out of the IRA. Is that something that like you took a little bit of time to think about? Yeah, absolutely. I don't really love using my own money. <laughs> I like other people's money. And, you know, I wasn't going to, I'm 28 years old. I'm not going to see my retirement account for a while. And the way I think about it is I could fail today and still be okay. I could lose all my money in my retirement account right now and still be okay and come out on the other end. So um, I definitely, it was just money there that I had available and I don't really love stocks because I don't really get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I know I could probably like learn more about it and do better at it, but sure. it just, really doesn't excite me and real estate does. So I just, just went for it with it. Okay. So now that we know that using the self-directed IRA was a, was a strategic move that worked for you in your first year, this is something you definitely wanted to talk about, which was your data year, right? Like you had your first year and then like, how was it with breaking down the numbers? Like, for those that are watching, when Mary and I were backstage before we actually did this, she definitely wanted to break down the numbers and go through everything that she did when she was in her first year. So there are seasoned people that could be listening, could be watching and, and know about what she went through her first year. But there's plenty of people that have never done this before, have no clue how to break down some of these things. And it takes time, right? Some of these take time. And I think Mary, if I'm not mistaken, when we were at yellow bird back in either February or March, didn't you win the, the bird belt, the yellow bird belt? Yep. So not only are you queen of the peapod, but you are, you won the yellow bird belt as having like, what was it deal of the month? Or it was like, um, you killed the deal. Like you, you did a great job with the deal and you shared it with everybody. Yep. That was a wholesale on the water. Um, it was worth about $500,000, like 
waterfront property is huge and um i got it for two two hundred thousand dollars and wholesaled it for about 220 so um it worked out for everybody and it was a pretty cool deal but um in my first year i did two flips four wholesales and then seven retail deals as well as giving back ten thousand dollars to military teachers healthcare providers because being a uh, military, it's, it's tough. And a lot of people, um, you know, give every single day. So I'm like, the best thing that I can do is give back. And I just, I love the business because I love meeting people and just, um, being able to give back is just such an honor. So, um, yeah, of course, Very blessed for sure. Yeah. Giving back to the community is something that is, and, and I know you're doing that too with the pea pod, right? Being, being queen of the pea pod, you know, we have mm -hmm. to talk about that while, while we're on the topic. Like what, what is that? Because for people that are, don't know Yellowbird or aren't in Jacksonville, I mean, Yellowbird is a huge community. It's a community and a, amazing real estate company that works with so many investors uh, whether it's wholesalers, new people, seasoned people, they're always willing to help. And Pat Flynn leads that group of the Peapod, and Mary is part of it and is crushing it in there. What What is that group, Mary, that has helped with mentorship and you giving back at the same time? Yeah, so um, Pat set up this Peapod group, and um, it's just a group of like-minded people, and they get together about once a week. And they set strict goals. So um, one of the major things about being an entrepreneur is there's nobody like hovering over you to make sure that you're doing the right things every day. And if you're going to eat an elephant, you've got to chip out away, chip away at it every single day. It's not like you're going to do a couple things here and then stop and then do a couple things here and stop. So Pat really helps you break down like what are your goals and what's your daily um, action plans? Because if you don't have action items, you're just never gonna end up doing it. And so um, we would get together and we'd make sure, hold ourselves accountable, make sure that we're all on the right track and just um, being a part of a community that propels you to go forward, it, it's, more than like more than anything anybody could ask for it's it really helps and um yeah so pat and he's also there for like teaching you how to do sales and talking to people talking to motivated sellers um teaches you all that kind of stuff and so it's it's a really cool community and i'm very blessed to be a part of it oh yeah it's super unique it, it definitely right. is so not awesome. to go sidetrack or backwards and forwards but we yeah. have to talk about your first year with data now that you're now that you won that belt you won the bird belt and you you're queen of the pea pod let's break down those numbers so i have no idea how you did it what the data is and i know you have stuff that you want to talk about so share that with us for the show like what is that number what are the numbers that break it down yeah so it's, it's basically the two flips four wholesales seven retail sales um, and then like how I did those is what, what I like to tell all my buyers or sellers is I give them both their options. I, I give them the retail sales, like we can list it on the MLS if you want, or we can give you a cash offer and it'll be a little bit more simple. And what I would do is I do door knocking, I do deal machine and I do cold calling. Um, those are my three main ways of marketing to people. And um, I also I'm, I'm also do mailers as well. I love my mailers um, because I can spend a little bit of money and then people end up calling me back and I capture that in my CRM and then I follow up with them afterwards. Um, so that's how I found like my first deal or my, that's how I find most of my deals. And um, just by doing those four things, it's just trickled down to like finding all my flips, doing all my wholesales and also doing retail sales as well. So, um, yeah. Good. Well, that's great because this is what it's all about. And tell everybody about the marketing side. Cause if you love direct mailers, you, I get people on the show that'll talk about cold calling being the way to go. I even had Mike McKay on the show. Mike had a great strategy. I think I was talking to you about this even backstage of, of Mike doing like a, 
he meets with the seller, he calls the seller. And then after the phone call, he'll do like a message, uh, a video message, right? Didn't we talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. You totally talked about that. And I'm like, oh, I've definitely got to use that too, because it's a lot about just people being talking to people and just communicating and whether you're in real estate or if you're in uh, another like entrepreneurial uh, path, we're all marketing. We have to market. If we don't market, we don't have any kind of lead generation. And so um, like direct mail marketing is probably my bread and butter. I know it's a little ar archaic, but um, it definitely helps, especially leverage my time because I can easily pull a list and put it into a direct mail marketing um, campaign. And then they call me and it just takes a little bit less time than cold calling. So um, one of the two things I wanted to mention were how to pull lists. So when I was first starting off, I pulled two free, I did free lists. I, you can pay for lists, but um, I was cheap. Um, you know, when you're first starting off, you want, you want to save all the money. So um, two free lists you can do are tax delinquent and vacant lists. I love these two because tax delinquents, if um, they're in tax delinquency, they either own their house full outright and clear because a lot of people who don't have mortgages on their house forget to pay taxes. And um, those people who own them outright and clear, there's really great opportunity there. They can sell and make a lot of money or they could even do owner finance deals. So I love the owner finance deals um, and I'm looking for more, but um, I haven't done one yet, but it'll come eventually. But, um, but, but then let's talk about that for a second yeah. because tax delinquents, there's three ways it goes, right? Mm -hmm. The first way is they can't pay it. Right. And so when they can't pay it, they go on the list, whether it is uh, you, you can't pay in November. Eventually, you go on a list in April. You really go on the list in May. And then you, you're like be getting bid on in June. And that's that tax delinquent list. Right. It goes for two years before it gets to a tax deed. Right. So right. they can't pay. They forgot to pay and somebody redeems it. But maybe they don't have the money or they it slipped their mind. But I don't know how you forget or they're deceased. <laughs> right? They're dead. Mm -hmm. So those, that's another route you go, right? So, when you, so you know, um, I think where you're even heading with this is that tax delinquent lists are calls to action for people to take action on, wait a second, I'm about to lose this property to a public auction, a tax deed auction. Is there any way to either intercept it beforehand and or help the people before it gets to that end? Or I don't know, maybe you buy it at the tax deed auction, but your strategy of the polling the list is strategic because of the call to action, right? Yes, if there's urgency there, I mean, I'm like their best friend. I'm like, hey, you gotta do something with this. Like, you don't wanna lose the house. So let's just sell the house and you can make some money off of it. And it's a win-win for everybody. Um, for so, sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and sa sa same thing, like pre foreclosures and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Same thing. It applies to them. They're going to lose it at a public auction or, um, and maybe it'll be underwater. Maybe you're helping them out by uh, preventing them from being in a deficiency situation. Yep. It's all about helping people. It's all about them helping them avoid like foreclosure or losing the house, you know, just I don't want to see anybody go through foreclosure. So I'd rather help them out before they get to that point and, you know, reach out to them at least. So um, if you go to the tax collector, coj.net um, website, and then you go to taxes, you go to data request, and then delinquent list. And then it's like, it's really tiny there. You got to click right there and then it'll pull up the entire tax delinquent list. And there's quite a few there and you just got to filter the um, Excel document to put into a um, mailer system and then you just mail them out and reach, they hopefully get to the right people and they'll reach back to you. And I have a way to like, I have um, a phone number that they call and they can go right into my CRM and then it goes right to my phone. So I answer them and uh, try and talk to them and see what, what's up, what's going on and what are you doing with this house? Cause I, 
really am looking for houses to buy here. Um, you know, and if, if there's a way I can help you out, let's work on something and at least be that wake up call before the tax, before um, the city gets involved. How are you standing out from the rest with the mailers though? Because any, so I had Jeff Rhodes on the show and his, his whole thing will be out probably by the time this is out. But Jeff Rhodes talks about mailers. Like when you watch that episode, Mary, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I really need to tap into this guy because he talks all about first class mail and how first class mail is actually the mail that goes on the top of the pile when the mail guy hands, mailman hands everything, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the first class mail is on the top. The other thing is that you could do like um, smaller cards, more condensed cards instead of like the long business car yeah. or the long business envelopes or I colors. Like those cards a lot better. I don't really like envelopes because envelopes take that extra, you got to open it up and look into it. If uh, it's just a mailer, it's just a quick flip flip. Okay. And hopefully they'll stay a little bit longer, but I've known uh, people, <laughs> been to people's houses where they just have a whole stack of mailers on their table, just tons of people reaching out to them. And the way I like stand out uh, is not only do I mail them, I also call them. And I'm just really good on the phone. I talk to them as if they're like one of my friends and I'm just like, what's up, what's going on? <laughs> you know, I, I'm looking for houses to buy in this area and, you know, just get that personal effect because it's really about um, people and trying to connect with people. And that's what the whole goal is, is to talk to as many people as possible. So if you're really good on the phone, let me ask you this. If you're really good on the phone, why not do cold calling? So I can reach more people at one time with mailers uh, than I could with direct call it cold calling. So um, I leverage my time in that way. I'll do the mailers and then call, uh, they'll come back, they'll call me and then I'll also reach out to them. And cold calling is in a direct science. Um, there's a lot of like erroneous uh, phone numbers out there and by direct mailing them and they call me, I know that is a valid phone number. I don't have to guess. And so the numbers are a lot better and the people who call me and the leads that have come in are a lot better and more motivated than if I were to call them first. Interesting. Very, very interesting how you see it from that end. And if it works for you, that works for you, right? Mm -hmm. Keep it going, keep it rolling. Yep. And That's all you gotta do is like, if it, if it works, it works. And yes, there's a lot of like people who overthink it and that's all great. But at the same time, it's also just timing too. It, it really is a lot about, do you reach the right people at the right time? Because, um, it's, or if you make a good impression, but it's a lot about timing. Um, and when you catch people, when you get people right. And then getting a hold of them, what's the message being able to convey it. And then, you know, what's the sell, right. And how do, how do you help them mm -hmm. all about how do you help them? So Mary, one of the things you also wanted to talk about on the show is creating goals, whether it is daily, yearly, monthly, whatever it is, but no matter what in, in this realm of investing, having a routine for your business, personally, professionally, in real estate, what is it like creating the routine? How did you, how did you get to that point of like, I know I got to do it this way because it works for me. Like you do it more in the afternoon, you do it more in the morning. Um, you space it out when you do your mailers, when you, when you time the calls, what is that routine like and how can you help others and inspire others to get more into a routine so that can help better their business? Because I don't know if I'd call it like I'm in a routine, right? Like, I don't know if I'd say I'm, I'm in a routine, right? Like I wake up, I, I have my coffee, I come into work, I work. And then at night is kind of like when I do my marketing, right? Like I do my law and my intake during the day. And then at night is when I kind of am planning the marketing and planning the emails and stuff like that. What is it like for you? Walk us through that and how you can inspire people. 
Yeah, so I started off like having two jobs, uh, still kind of am. Um, and so it's it's hard at the end of the day to come back and start working on this, but it's actually not so much for me because I love real estate. Um, and so what I did was time block. Um, Pat actually helped the, me out with this in the pea pod. And we just like sat down and we went over our goals and I made like actionable goals. I, um, for instance, I want to double what I did in 2020. So I want to do four flips, four wholesale, seven retail or uh, 14 retail sales. And so I broke it down. And what I had to do is I have daily goals because it's, it's easy to like, say you want to do a year goal, but they're always hard to, they're hard to go for if you don't have daily goals and you got to work every single day towards those goals. So my day kind of looks like I go to my nine to five job, which is actually like uh, seven to 3 PM. And then right after I'm done with uh, regular work, I do my retail and I basically work till sometimes seven o'clock at night. Um, just because I love it. And um, if you find that thing that you love so much that you're willing to work extra for, it's it's got to be worth it. So um, I do 30 cold calls um, or I talk to 30 people um, each day and then uh, during the weekdays. And then at, on the weekends, Saturday mornings, I do my driving for dollars and I have to get at least um, 60 new um, driving for dollar leans and the driving for dollars for those who don't know you drive around and you take pictures of distressed houses and when you take a picture it'll automatically send them a mailer and again I have my phone number on there and that phone number goes to my CRM and then when they call me I can reach out to them or I can follow up with them. And it's really about follow-up game. Like you got to keep following up with people because the first time you talk to somebody, it's like a warm up, And then the second time they're like, okay, you actually are like legit. You're not just a fly by night person. And then you set up an appointment and the more appointments you can get, the better because you want to just be in front of people. And the more you're in front of people, the more likely you're going to get a deal. Um, so that's kind of like my week in a overview. Um, and each day I just work on it and, uh, chip away at it. And you got to keep going with it. You can't, you can't slow down. It's, it's like a, it's like a contact sport, you know, like if you're training, you don't want to stop training because you're going to get out of shape, like running. I'm a big runner. And if you run every single day, it's a whole lot easier to run a marathon at the end of the week. But like once a month, it's not so much, it's not so easy. So it's, it's really, you got to keep going at it and it's determination and consistency that really put, pulls you apart from everybody else because um, enthusiasm is common, but persistency is uh, rare. So that being said, what is your why? My why is I want to live a life free of somebody else. I want to be able to make money on my own um, and just own my life. I, I don't want to like end up at the end of my life being like, Oh, I wish I did. Or I wish I did that. I want to, we only have one life in this world and I want to live it to the fullest. So, um, every day I'm just going for it, going for my dreams and seeing how it turns out. And your mindset always changes either from year to year, day to day. Yes. There's, there's always, Absolutely. Yeah, I forgot who was telling me about that. I think it was actually Kyle Paskowitz. When we were on a clubhouse call, he was telling me something about like, you know, your your mindset 10 years ago is completely different than your mindset now. And I'm like, well, first of all, that's so true, right? <laughs> I mean, if right, you think, it is. Yeah, if you Every think day, about it. It changes. Changes, right? So like 
Uh, if you asked me what I was going to do uh, 10 years ago, I don't know if it'd be right now, right? right. Um, and so uh, I guess the same thing with your why. And I even had Dustin Griffin on, who is the Tampa Bay RIA leader over the Tampa RIA leader over in Tampa and Atlanta. And um, I, we, we even talked about this question also. And it was, it was interesting, his answer, which was he had his why in his first half of his uh, years. Now in going on into the second half, um, he's got a whole different why, but giving back, whether it's charitable. So it's, um, you know, and you and I are both young. So we both, you know, there's so much changing and so much um, uh, direction that it can go in. So having a why now is is very important because you'll see, as I, I know Kyle's right about it, things change over time. So very, it's a very, uh, it can be a deep conversation uh, with people like Wally Conway. Wally talked about that. I think it was the last in-person Yellowbird meeting that we had in 2020 in March. I think he was talking about, uh, or the one thing. I think it was like the one thing, which is could be kind of like your why, but I'm sure Wally would tell me something else about that. Um, but having that, Mary, um, you know, is is very important. Um, and and knowing what you are looking for, at least now. Right. Yeah, what are you looking you just for? Wake up like five years from now and be like, oh my God, what did I do with the past five years of my life? You know, and it's easy to get stuck in that nine to five job doing everything that everybody else around you is doing. And it's easy to just get carried away. And then you wake up one day and you're like, you know, five years older and you're like, <laughs> what did I just do with that five years? Like, did I really spend it to the maximum capacity? Like, so I want to just live life to the fullest and, you know, not wonder like, or wish, oh man, I wish I'd done that because I hear from all my mentors, like, or I also would be like in my nine to five job and I'd be like listening to people and they'd be like, oh, I wish I did that when I was younger. And I'm like, well, thinking to myself, I'm young, I can do this. Like I should just do it and go for it and see what happens. For sure. Um, and I, and I'll just share this with you because this is great content, right? Like I can think of two times that happened to me. One was before or in the middle of college, right? When you all of a sudden see everybody passing you by with getting into uh, corporate jobs and getting internships. And you're like, what am I doing with my life right now? Right. That was one. I re distinctly remember it was like after a holiday break. And I was like, wait a second, like all of this that I'm doing right now is not going to, I'm on a trajectory. That's not going to work out if I keep going this path. And the second time it's funny, like, like, you know, there's that expression of when you wake up and go, wait, what's happening? That is real stuff, right? So I remember specifically, I think it was after law school, um, while I was studying for the bar, or I think it was like either like while I was waiting for results or after I passed sometime in that law school era, which was I woke up and I was like, wow, it's over already. Like, it's like, it's, it's like, I, I remember going, what's going on. Right. <laughs> but when you have something like what I do now, where I have the podcast, I have all the probate. I, I, you know, I do what I do. You have something to look forward to and you're passionate about and you can, you keep moving. So you're right. You don't want to be in that position of waking up and saying, well, what's going on. You want to, you want to have something that you are working towards, you know, goals, working towards a vision. Um, I think, you know, you're just always innovating, but working towards a vision of what you want is really critical. So, uh, you know, I have so many guests on Mary and people will be listening to this on iTunes and Spotify and YouTube. And a lot of people love listening to these things right now, which is really interesting. But what I've noticed is everybody's got a different theme to what they're covering. Everybody's got different um, visions uh, to what they're trying to achieve. But at the end of the day, a lot of this doesn't even break down to real estate. It breaks yeah. down to business, like right? That and business. And it's just a mindset shift for sure. It's, it's been a mindset shift from day one. It's taking control of your life and breaking apart from the herd per se, breaking apart from like what the normal traditional route is, is getting a nine to five job. But it's, it's really a lot about mindset and changing the way you do everything and living your life every day. 
for sure. You have to do that the right way. Mm -hmm. So valuable stuff or going back and forth. This is like a great conversation with what's happening, right? What, yeah. what are you, do, what are you doing? Uh, the young professional group right here. So right. Mary in every podcast and show that I have, I always ask really core critical questions that are the signature questions of the show. Right. right. So I always ask these, I don't know if I told you about these backstage, but I have, <laughs> she's ready for these. She's going to be all prepared. So, um, you can, you can do a lightning round. We could do, we could talk about it, you know, pick what you want. Um, and I've realized actually the lightning round is pretty good when it comes to this stuff, but uh, okay. So, <laughs> Uh, every investor or realtor has a different way that they work with people, right? Because people have different attitudes, behaviors, personalities, everybody's different. So when you're approaching that deal and you're either getting to the contract or you're asking whether they wanted to sell it, how do you really engage with that person and build trust with them so that they work with you? It's not just in the beginning of the deal, not just throughout the deal, but even from beginning to end and even beyond. How are you building that trust with people? I'm just really transparent. You know, everybody like is very guarded at first when you first meet them. And I rightfully so. If I, you know, met somebody off the road, I'm just like, what are you, who are you? Like, what do you want to do? So I always just tell them who I am, what I'm doing and what I'm looking for. And, um, I just, I just try to always put myself in their position as well. I want to see where they're coming from because everybody has different perspectives. Everybody is coming from different walks of life. And I just like to see what they're going through and try and, um, you know, empathize about what they're going through and how can I help? It's always, how can I help? Because no matter what, it's always about helping people and getting people out of sticky situations and solving a problem for somebody else. Yeah, I had, when I had Ron on, I asked him the same question. I asked everyone that question, right? The signature question. And Ron was like, it's all about how do you help them having a solution, bringing, there's a problem, they need a solution. What do you have to do to solve that problem? Yeah. So same thing, right? Empathizing with the situation and figuring out how do we get there? And I could see how they're, they're they got to be into you, Mary, because uh, you're soft spoken, um, you, you know, you're approachable, um, yep. you're engaging. So I could see how people are the the sellers are interested in working with you. Yeah. And it's just full transparency and helping them out. And like, what can I do to help you? That's it at the end of the yeah. day. So another big signature question I ask on the show is, what is a great tip and or trick to locking up the contract to get to closing? What like, so now you've built the trust and it could be the same answer, right? It could be somewhere in that same thing, but like, what is a great tip? Like I've had, um, I can't remember who it was now. There's been like 30, 35 episodes so far, but somebody was like, bring the contract. I think it was Adam Locklear. He was like, bring the contract to that uh, uh, seller. 100% bring the contract, but also like I build up a little bit of rapport and I don't try and dwell in that building up the rapport. Um, one of my weaknesses, and that's one of the big things you need to know in this business is what's your like strengths and weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is getting to the ask. I do build up a lot of rapport and I just need to be able to ask them, what are you willing to sell this house for? And so when I work with a seller, I'm like, what can we do today to do this? Because I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to waste my time. And I just straight up ask them, like, what can we do today to get this uh, problem solved for you? And how can I help you today? Because it's definitely difficult following up with people and always setting those reminders to follow up. And it just takes more time. And the best thing you can do is work on getting it closed that day. Yeah. Just keep on asking questions. If even if they say no, it doesn't mean no. There's always like something behind the no. Like why, why are you saying no? What, what else can we do to add this? Like do you, sometimes it's as simple as, uh, no, I don't want to sell on this date, but I could 
sell the next Monday because they've got something else going on in the background that you just don't know about. They're holding back a card. They're saying they're holding back um, a little nugget of information and they just, you just got to keep asking like, why, what can we do to, why not here? We can do this day. Does that work for you? Kind of thing. They've obviously responded. So if they didn't want to respond and, and deal with you, they wouldn't do anything at all. But um, it's funny, even when you get a no, it's like, but why? Right. So it's yeah. the so same thing. The fact that they even said that was a signal. Yep. And like, sometimes I'll ask a question and they'll say no. And then I'm like, okay. And I go to another question. It's always about asking questions and then listening. And um, listening is one of the things that you got to get really good at is listening to what they're saying and what's behind what they're saying. And so uh, if I ask one question in one way, I might ask it and they say no, I might ask it again in another way. And it's just twisting it just a little bit, but that little twist is enough to get them to say what's really going on. What's really happening? How do we do this? What's go? Yeah, what's, what's the ping and issue? What's the root issue about how, why this is not going forward? So getting to that point is big time. Yep. So- now to the last signature question. And if the answer is probate, you know, I can't get off the show without talking about probate, right? Yeah. You know it too, right? I mean, what would this, <laughs> what would I be here for? Right? Exactly. So if the answer is probate, then we'll talk about it. And if not, we'll talk about it after, but I get different answers every time about this. It could be appraisers. It could be lenders. It could be uh, the contract people not responding. It could be tenants not letting you into the property. It could be an array of things that happen, title work, um, a surveying, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, there are times when the deal may not happen or something may delay it. So in the world of Mary Henton, what do you think is your biggest deal killer? Uh. Biggest deal killer, um, you know, the black horse or the black swan, as one of the books that I've read um, would say, uh, is there's always like somebody behind. Um, if you're not talking to the decision maker and you know, and you don't know that there's somebody else back there making the decisions, that's the biggest deal killer for me. I just recently had a deal fall through because I was talking to the wife and the wife was on board with selling. She was okay with it. And then her ex-husband comes into the picture and actually like says, um, no, oh, no, don't sell. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it up for you. You know, like you don't have to worry about this. And it actually uh, ruined it. And I'm like, just not getting all the people in the right um, in the right room really is getting everybody in the right room and all on the same page is huge. So that was one recent thing that just happened to me um, that I I make sure whenever I make an appointment I make sure that all the decision makers are in that room because I want everybody to be on the same page and I want to address all of their concerns and questions at the same time. So funny. I can't remember who it is, but this is like the second or third time I've heard that one too, right? Like making sure, get, yeah, get everybody together because as soon as they go back home, yeah, this rings a bell to a prior episode. I'm going to make like an Excel spreadsheet about like who said this. Well, this is why we're asking the questions, right? So Pablo and my, the team will get together. We'll make like a compilation of all these answers. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, I should make a spreadsheet because I'm like, this one said this, this one said this, these five all are on board with this. Um, yeah. but, I, but I've heard that many times um, uh, from different people, even not on the show about how like, you know, I'm, I would talk about that with probate. You got to get everybody on board. If you tell one and not five, um, how do they know what's going to happen in the deal? So um, getting everybody in that one meeting. So then they're not going back and playing telephone. It's like, what did they say? And then they said B, but I thought it was A and then everybody's off track and uh, not on the same page, right? It's just- right. If there's question in their mind and they're uncertain about something, like then it makes the deal a whole lot difficult. It's a lot more difficult to like just corral everybody, make sure that everybody's on the same page. And that way you're talking directly to them and it's not that telephone game because that telephone game is dangerous. It is. It very much is because you never get the 
right information across. Yeah. So um, last but not least, we're going to talk about probate. Okay. So what in the world of probate does Mary find crazy, unusual, wild? Hmm. Um, crazy or unusual, wild? Um, I don't know. I've had one probate case and a lot of people just don't know who to go to. And I find it like unusual how common it is to, um, hear horror stories about probate. And I'm, whenever I talk to somebody who's going through probate or, um, is about to go through probate, I'm like, Hey, don't worry about it. I've got Al Nicoletti. He's my, like, he's awesome. I work with him very closely and he'll take care of you. You know, like, you know, you're in good hands when you're with Al Nicoletti. So I always like push him to you and, you know, like tell him, um, Al knows everything about probate and he'll answer all of your questions. I, I, hey, I love it. I appreciate that, Mary. I mean, yeah. the, at the end of the day, you have to work with people that that understand that there is a problem. There could be a solution. There could be something that is going on and you got to get creative with stuff, right? You have to get super creative with what's happening and working with the right team, the right title companies too, right? Working with everybody in the pie makes everything work and makes everything better. So yeah. yet, you know, I totally understand it's, it's what it is working with the right people makes all the difference. Absolutely. Yeah. And like a lot of people don't think about probate. I don't think when they, when this happens to them, they're caught off guard and it's just something people don't think about until they need the professionals to help them walk them through it. Exactly. That's the whole name of the game finding the right people and play and you work together. Yep. Yeah. So that's what the secret sauce is. There you go. Well, Mary, you are amazing. We've gone on for about an hour now. It's been incredible. You know, I'm going to have you in an in-person studio one day, uh, whenever it's set up. Cause you, you know, we'll, we'll even break down numbers on a whiteboard. We could break down numbers on a sheet. However it is, it'd be really cool to actually see you do it in action. Um, uh, you know, like, like PowerPoints, right? Like people love the PowerPoints to see how things are broken down and what you do, but love having you. We, we, you know, it's so easy to have that conversation with you. I get the rapport. I could see the engagement. Like that's where a lot of this plays a role with tapping into people is being able to engage, having a relatability factor, which makes all the difference. So you were amazing. I loved having you on here. We talk about all that self-directed IRA thing. It's like really piquing my interest because you have those companies out there with New View, Advanta, so many, and you had Equity, Equity Trust. So um, great, great topics that are super valuable for the show. And I loved it. And thank you so much for talking with me about this, Mary. Oh, of course. Anytime. anytime. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do it again. We'll make sure we do it again. We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll talk about more. And there will be new adventures of Mary Henton, right? There's going to be yeah. new things that come up. What's only the, the second year? Only, yeah, this is going on second year. Second year. So there's plenty more to come. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Well, Mary, I will see you soon. I'm sure I'm going to see you in person uh, soon at one of the events, but thanks again. I loved having you here and we'll make sure everybody gets this content. And for people, so Mary, before I get, get you off, who are you looking to connect with and who do, would you like reaching out to you? How can they get a hold of you? I need to make sure I have your social links, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, whatever you got. Yep. Uh, I have a uh, Hinton Homes Facebook page and uh, Instagram as well, H&H. &H, uh, Home buyers is my um, company and uh, just feel free to look me up on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, you know, I'm always here uh, on those two platforms looking to connect with like-minded people who are also real estate investors, wholesalers, um, and people looking to sell and buy houses. So anything to do, anything to do with real estate. <laughs> Anything to do. And and there you go. We'll make sure, Mary, we have all those. I think you dropped it in the Calendly uh, link, but we'll make sure we post it for everybody. They know how to get a hold of you. You're queen of the Peapod for the whole Yellowbird community. So again, yeah, yeah, we need that. We need the crown. We need that crown over there for you. So <laughs> thanks again, Mary. Loved having you. Thanks so much, Alan. 
Okay, everybody, if you want more content like this, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel, the Al Nicoletti Facebook and business page where you can find more content on probate quiet title partitions and this amazing episode, which will come out with Mary Henton talking all about the self-directed IRAs and all the other podcast shows and sessions I've had with these amazing rock stars, movers and shakers and club leaders and super investors all in Florida. All the content will be there. You can check it out on iTunes, Spotify. I think it's also Stitcher now too that we have all set up. So make sure you check it out and I will see you next time on the Al Nicoletti Show. Take care.